is uh, coming from uh, Mr. Sh uh, Shachindra. I met him uh, maybe four or five years back. Uh, so he is a graduate of VTU. Uh, he is a uh, bachelor's degree in electrical and electronics engineering. And uh, when he started his career, he joined as a project engineer at Wipro. But subsequently, he moved into training roles and he started delivering trainings on embedded systems, robotics, IoT, product development, computer vision. So that is uh, uh, when I got introduced to Shachindra Kumar because I was also uh, through Devopedia and uh, earlier, I was also conducting IoT workshops and Python workshops. So that's when I got introduced to him. And subsequently, in 2017, uh, he started as a consultant for Blockchain Mind. So he's been in the blockchain space for the last uh, five years, uh, almost uh, from the time blockchain become, became a buzzword in 2017. He's been uh, closely involved with the technology. And uh, he's also, you know, kind of uh, very passionate about uh, like technology and uh, startups. So he has held various roles like CTO and uh, CEO. Right now he is the CEO of uh, Lazarus Network. So this company is uh, focusing on AI and blockchain technologies with the aim of creating a decentralized network. So as you know, a decentralized net network is supposed to give you better privacy, security, anonymity. So that is one of the goals of a decentralized network. And uh, as a CEO of Lazarus Network, he's uh, doing that. So that's all I know about Lazarus Network. Perhaps uh, Shachindra can share more information. Over to you, Shachindra. We can begin the talk. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Arvind. Thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, yeah, just to kind of add up, uh, um, we are focused in cybersecurity, but now we have going to into different domains, um, namely GameFi and also into DeFi and NFTs. So it's more like next exploring the nexus of cybersecurity, uh, uh, blockchain, Web3 and GameFi and bringing, bringing more solutions where Web2 uh, uh, and Web3 can be bridged so that newer merchants and newer uh, corporations can leverage the the stack of decentralized uh, decentralized stack without having to get their hands dirty with encryption and and all of these newer technology which is very hard there is a very hard learning curve so you don't have to do all that you can just implement these sdks no code and local solutions that is what we are currently aiming to do and with this particular talk um i would like to uh, give everyone a particular introduction and and talk about what uh, various potentials they can explore uh, uh, in, into the field of NFTs. So if everyone can see my screen, I would like to begin my slideshow. So NFT, I mean, unless you're living under a rock, you must have heard this particular buzzword with everybody talking about what is the next big NFT, the blue chip NFT, and, and where can they grab onto this particular train? So here is we're gonna talk about uh, what exactly this means, what it represents, and what are the various use cases and why is it becoming so much in 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 uh, in in talks uh, and in demand uh, earlier I, I think you would have heard of blockchain crypto bitcoin namely and and various other chains but then uh, in the past few years you would have seen defi uh, being one of the the important trends one of the uh, one of the biggest trends and now nft is taking that particular place and and pretty much every other corporation or or big company or even a collector uh, or, or a celebrity would be thinking of launching their own nft to uh, tokens so uh, and if you're looking into the current market as well uh, india or asia pacific or even in 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 the western country i mean pretty much there is something happening into uh, nft marketplaces uh, creating collectibles or or creating some sort of payment mechanism where you could purchase these NFTs and 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 get into this particular bandwagon, you know. So we're gonna get into market and 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 different use cases later. But getting into before we even talk about NFTs, I just want to uh, give a quick round over on how many types of assets are there. So if I want to classify into this this four different dimension, um, we definitely have these fungible assets, right? You have got a US dollar, uh, you've got Ethereum, Bitcoin. If you collect air miles, let's say you you you, go, you, you take your flight and then you collect miles. So all of these are fungible assets. I mean, these are very much interchangeable, right? And if I'm talking about tangible assets, 
So if you've got Indian rupee note in your in your wallet, if you've got like gold bars, all of these things are again tangible asset that you can touch. But again, it's also fungible. One rupee note would a hundred rupee note would always be equal to another hundred rupee note. You mean you can exchange it for any other hundred rupee note and you would have the same value, right? But then now we are talking. If if you want to get into non fungible aspect of things, um, then if you're if if you're thinking of non fungible asset, that means these are not very much interchangeable. Let's say you've got title deed or a particular car, uh, say a limited edition car or even a picture of Mona Lisa. I mean these things would be very hard to to put a to put a value upon, right? You cannot just say, oh, this particular house would be very much interchangeable for this particular house in a different location. No, these both two these two things are totally different things. And if I'm talking about intangible assets, or if I'm if I, if I can say virtual assets, right? Let's say you've got an IP right for a particular song or a particular movie. These things are not interchangeable at all, right? So NFTs would potentially right now uh, link into this particular aspect, into this particular third quadrant uh, or, or, or the bottom left quadrant, because that is what particular area uh, NFTs are, are kind of uh, getting a lot of attention into, you know? So we'll see this how. So if I'm going to have to class, if I'm going to have to like introduce NFTs in simple term, you can think of this as a cryptographic token. So when I say cryptographic token is like the underlying um, uh, token. So when I say token is like it, it's just a representation. It's a it's a digital asset, and it's uh, it is backed by a cryptographic algorithm. That means it 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 essentially it essentially uh, is going to be representing a different kind of asset in in the back, in behind. So let's say you've got a particular token. Now it will always it it ha doesn't has its own in it has its own inherent uh, ar uh, attributes, but it will always represent a distinctive and a unique asset, right? It is not uh, something uh, uh, that you would find any other in in, in the market. Now the unique characteristics that are coming in from the particular asset won't be able to be exchanged for any other item. So in simple terms, it's just a digital or cryptographic token um, uh, uh, on a particular blockchain, which will have its own unique characteristic and it will be very distinctive in nature. There will be no second one uh, which will be resembling the same thing and that could be called an NFT. And NFT would be only one uh, within within all of these particular um, now, within all of these particular uh, collection of tokens. So just if I'm going to be, if think of this, if I am tokenizing a particular art and now that art will basically not be equal to any other token and that will be unique. And and of course, if you can, you have ownership rights to it. So we, we, we are coming down to core characteristics. So if you are clear with the particular introduction, so um, going further, so when when I create an NFT, when I say that this is an NFT, I have this. So what are the key characteristics that come inherently with this? It is indivisible. So let's say you've got a hundred dollar note. That I mean, if I'm going to be comparing this in a, in a fungible terms, you won't be able to divide it into like two different notes with fifty three dollars each or fifty rupees each. This is indivisible. You cannot destroy this because uh, if an NFT is living on a blockchain. Um, uh, automatically, you know, I mean, all the entries to the blockchain are kind of immutable in nature. So you won't be able to like kind of delete that token. It's not a database number that you can go ahead and delete that particular thing and then it, it suddenly vanishes away. There are certain uh, tokens where you have the option. I mean, that's a, 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 a I would say conditions applied or it's a it's a, it's another attribute that uh, the certain NFT collections also house a particular function that called burn. So in case you the, the the end of life has been reached so you can always or you want to delete that there is a particular uh, function that you can call and then that uh, particular token will be deleted but inherently uh, no third person can destroy that um, ownership uh, it will always have a particular owner and that will be automatically uh, be validated across the network that means inherently it is transparent um, or and, and public in nature everybody can verify who is who is this owner Again, it will have some sort of rarity because since it is unique in nature, um, you can always know that this is very rare or this is um, less rare than its counterparts within the same asset class. Again, when I say verifiable, like everybody can verify when was it created. You can tra you can have the whole um, life cycle. You can track the whole life cycle when it was created, when was it transferred, at what value was it transferred, or if there was a sale happening. All of these things would be basically visible uh, on the public ledger. And again, interoperable. So that means you could basically 
do multiple things uh, once you are able to uh, a certain certain trap properties of the NFT. We'll get into interoperability later when we have to get into the use cases. But these are the core key characteristics that are associated with an NFT, and that is why it is very much um, in 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 demand. And and we're going to see that. Um, out. So, how do you create an NFT? Let's say you are very much excited and you would want to get into this, uh, into this particular creation of NFT. Now, um, as I said, a, a, a NFT is just a, a cryptographic token. Uh, but that means like it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a value-backed um, token. So you have it. It won't have an underlying. It won't. It, it won't just have a, a value just moment you have created a token. It needs to represent a particular asset. So you have to select a digital asset. Um, right now we are only focusing on digital asset. I mean there have been some attempts into creating uh, or linking tangible or or physical asset with NFT. We're not going to get into that complex things right now. So think of the, if there is a digital asset because uh, understanding and and uh, determining uniqueness of a particular digital asset is is very easy. So think of a digital asset. Let's say you've I've got an image, music, or a video, or a doc file, whatever it is. You have to have that particular thing, and you must have some sort of copyright to it because it must be your IP. It shouldn't be someone else's, you know. So once you have selected that, you have to handle storage. Now you need to store it somewhere where everybody can potentially view this. So now you can decide uh, whether you want to store this particular image or this particular file in Amazon AW, uh, on AWS S3 or you want to store it in, 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 in Dropbox or wherever you want to, or you can move this particular file into decentralized storage like IPFS or or maybe um, uh, other C Skynet or any other decentralized storage provider where this thing becomes again, uh, uh, you, you cannot delete it. And, and of course, there are certain properties that, that comes with decentralized storing as, as storage as well. Now, once you have handled the storage, you have to create some sort of a metadata. Now you have to create an asset metadata, and that metadata needs to need to be in a specific format, um, where this metadata would be containing the unique fingerprint. Now, whenever you have stored this asset, that asset will have some sort of like a fingerprint. You can think of that as a uh, either a SHA-256 hash, or you could have that a particular URL where that asset would definitely. Uh, be present whenever you want to have access to it. And the moment you create a metadata, you would now create a token uh, as the fourth step. You will mint a particular token. That means you create a token out of thin air, um, which will represent this particular metadata. In 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 simple terms, uh, this hash would would now be representing a particular token. And now this token will be in a part of a collection. Now, if you're thinking of a singleton token, that means in one collection there is only going to be one token. But mostly you will have like a collection which will have multiple token uh, as a part of the same asset class, right? So if you have got a collection of, of uh, art based tokens, so all of there will be like multiple tokens which will represent its own individual artwork, right? And that particular collection will have a name and symbol. Um, so just to kind of clarify here, the asset doesn't get stored on the blockchain because um, I don't want to get much into it, but the storage on blockchain is very expensive. So what happens is like you store it somewhere on on a decentralized or or, or any any uh, any any particular uh, media storage uh, uh, protocol, and then you link that particular hash, uh, a unique URI, into that particular token itself. So ERC seven two one Ethereum request for comments uh, uh, number seven twenty one was basically. Uh, gotten into that creating that particular specification as to how what kind of different functionalities this token would, is going to have and and what would basically it represents how you can create your own and programmatically that's what that particular um, ERC 721 spec talks about so so let's say you've got a you've created a digital art um, however you'd want to let's say you've created this now how its metadata would look like would be something like this. It's a it's a JSON metadata, right? So it will have a description, so you can give it some sort of description. They will have a external URL. That means there is this particular asset lives on this particular URL. Now this is the image. So this image would basically represent uh, is is living particular here. So you have this particular media file which is accessible from this particular URL. Now it does have it is going to have its own name, and now there will be certain other attributes that we're going to look into detail right now, right? So the underlying value of the NFT NFT is again related to the asset it represents. Um, so going further into the spec, uh, 
now people those who are from the te- uh, technology and who have been who are from having a developer background uh, i just want to go a little bit into the eip uh, uh, 721 spec so here uh, it was created by the author at that particular time and this was to uh, before this there was already this uh, erc20 right fungible token or or I, and and there was this um uh, movement of creating icos and there were like already some so many um uh, projects creating their own tokens right so and those tokens were at that time fungible tokens uh, but uh, crypto kitties was one of the projects that started with this idea that you would have a physical property that you would have linked to a particular token now there will be like virtual virtual collectibles like collectible cards baseball cards you know and then some negative value asset like loans uh, burdens or any other responsibility all of these things needed to be tokenized this was the motivation around it so they created a specification which will have certain functions now they, they will have there will be certain events now you will you will have a particular interface there will be some events like you can transfer this you can approve this token uh, to be spent on behalf of you through a particular escrow now you can check your own balance you can check who is owning that particular token who is the owner of that and then there are certain other functions that you can call uh, to to initiate transfer uh, from one party to another party you can approve certain person to uh, expend on your behalf and stuff like that you know so all of these things were described in the interface and it's um, once that inter- interface was dis- uh, decided upon like it will have a particular name it will have a symbol and of course it will have a, uh, a token uri so whenever you have a token id and you want to call what this token represents you will have a particular token uri which will point to a particular json file that confirms to the erc721 metadata uh, json schema and this was the particular schema at that time it uh, this was decided upon and and of, of course um, um, and see so uh, oh and of course this metadata standards kept evolving so you will have a description you will have an image and then there will be certain more tags uh, that will be uh, that, that that will be like created i think you can look into this uh, and in detail as to um, what other sorts of metadata um, uh, standards are out there uh, let me just And see metadata standards. So let me just go uh, ahead in detail. Yeah, and of course, uh, so the, here are all of these token standards. So there is one of the implementation. So there are many projects uh, that implement NFT uh, uh, contract. So CryptoKitties was one of the first. I am going to refer the Open Zeppelin one. So there is the code where they have implemented this. So each and every uh, uh, contract will have its own name, and then you have defined that. This particular uh, token has a uh, variable, some some name is name symbol and and so on. All of these properties are defined. Um, so, uh, and uh, again, uh, here you will have that particular function that prints that. Token. Yeah, so there, there is a safe mint and there is a mint token. So the moment you call mint, you have to pass who, who is going to basically get this ownership of the token and what is the token id and then that pretty much increases the balance of that particular user by one and then so on right and whenever you create a token um, you have this token uri which basically gives you a json representation now it has its own metadata structure um, let me increase the font here so this is the metadata structure that uh, I think we have explained it over on this particular part. So this particular metadata would represent that particular picture. And then also you would have certain more attributes. So if you want to represent your token having, uh, let's say your token is an artwork which has the sad personality and also you could define that as part of this JSON attribute like trait type and value, trait type and value. So you, you have a key value pair, just how you create any JSON field. So that's all. So once you have defined um, that what is your particular asset if it is an image of a, a flying ghost or a flying cat whatever it is uh, and then you define the metadata about it like where this is hosted what is its name what is the description um, and uh, if there are further more attributes then you define this out you save it somewhere as a, as a json file and then you pass that along uh, and mint your token so uh, we have got one particular uh, uh, platform 
uh, there are m- multiple platform. I think you can go ahead and open uh, go ahead and open C and create your own particular token uh, here, uh, or you can uh, just go to, if you are a developer. If you're, if you're familiar with the particular uh, 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 remix ID, you can copy paste that particular code from GitHub and put it over here. Deploy it on particular network. I think I've deployed it on uh, it, uh, Polygon test network, which is having a particular uh, token network ID. Uh, the moment you deploy this, you will see that the NFT contract is deployed at this particular address. So let me just search for it. If you're getting lost on this, uh, I, I, I can I can uh, uh, take another. I can I can explain this uh, in detail. Uh, maybe after the uh, entire uh, entire uh, presentation is over. So this is where this particular contract has been deployed, and the entire contract would you would also be able to see it from over here. So this is the entire. Uh, uh, NFT contract here, and if you have if you have deployed this already, then you would also see certain functions coming in, right? So you can check your balance, you can see the name. Uh, I have given when I was deploying the contract, I have given the name here as uh, my NFT, and then this is the name he's coming in. And you can also these are the uh, 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 write functions, these are the read only functions. So you will have all of these characteristics. And those people who are not developers. They can go to either of these platform and create an asset. So let me see. Let, let's see. Um, uh, let's create one particular token on a test net. So uh, we'll be using a test network where the, the un- underlying uh, underlying asset to create the uh, uh, or pay for transaction is coming for free. Unless if you use a, a main network, then you have to buy real Ethereum, which is again trading for certain value, and then you can uh, you'll have to again spend that much value to. Uh, tr- do blockchain based transactions. So that's why we will be using um, a, a particular public test network. So let me just confirm if I have some value. So MetaMask is another uh, a wallet where you have blockchain uh, assets. So I, I have certain value so I can pay for these transactions. So I'll just give a particular name. So a demo art. And then Let's let's I'm, I'm I'm just creating a particular picture. Um, now I want to put a particular asset price. So let me think like I want to put this for 0.1 matic. Now I'll choose a particular. Now I I can decide whether I want to tokenize an image, audio, or document. So I'll just select a particular image. Um, let me just pick this. So the moment I pick a particular image here. Uh, I can see this and also I can select a particular category. And so they, it will basically initiate two transactions. So the first transaction is where you are creating that particular. Uh, 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 NFT itself, right? So it, it shows you you are interacting with a particular contract, um, a certain contract which is starting with 0x, A50 and stuff, right? So so it says transaction one in progress. Um, now you can see in my MetaMask that it it is currently in queued and once that particular transaction gets uh, executed gets confirmed it's taking a bit of time okay so it got confirmed now it will be asking me for a second transaction this would mean that now the now the token has been created now the token which has been created is going to be moving from my wallet to an escrow to a contract where it could be sold to other third parties, right? So uh, now I am basically interacting with another contract where it is going to create market item, right? So, so this would be another contract where the token which was created by me, I am putting that into the market and I'm signing that particular transaction. Both of the transactions, once they have been uh, uh, they have been successfully executed. Um, we can also see the particular contract directly uh, from the blockchain since every information is public in nature. 
uh, we can see that there are totally 62 CRTFY. So uh, there was a contract called Creatify, uh, and totally there have been 62 different tokens within that particular collection. And if I see there was a one minute ago, there was a transaction which was about creating artifacts. So the create artifact function was called, which minted a token creating from zero address to my address. The token ID was 62. So if I click on that particular transaction, so. This is. OK, so let me just go ahead and read certain parameters. So here the contract has some additional roles uh, in order to differentiate between various people. Like there will be like an admin, there will be creator, there will be some operator. But um, I, or if I want to know like how many NFTs I hold within a particular um, uh, wallet, then all I need to do is like balance. I need to check my own balance. So it will basically give me a query like I've got two particular NFTs in my own particular account. Right now, since I already remember what is my token ID, right? So I will just go ahead and check the token URI. So this is the most important function here and I will enter the, the token ID here. 62. This is what the token represents. So this token is basically uh, rep is representing a, a, an asset which is lying on this particular URI. Now uh, you might have heard URL, which is Uniform Resource Locator. Um, here this is URI, Uniform Resource Identifier, which is a superset of URL. Um, and this is not living on uh, a particular HTTP endpoint. This is living on IPFS endpoint, right? So we'll we will discuss IPFS uh, in detail in some other time, but think of this uh, as a as a protocol where the file gets stored not by its location, but by its contents, right? So IPFS endpoints are very easy to resolve. So it's IPFS.io slash IPFS plus this. Unless you have a browser, something like Brave, which automatically resolves that particular uh, um, uh, you are you have to go through a HTTP endpoint and resolve this. So I think this was the same in values that I had put up, right? So I gave the now that I gave a particular description. Let me just increase the font. So the, I gave the particular name. There was a description, the, um, and and I gave the image, right? Again, the image basically gone into an HTTP uh, instead of going to an HTTP endpoint. I'm not storing that image in S3. I'm storing it again on IPFS, right? So again, if I want to resolve this, I will again. Uh, just copy this IPFS endpoint and just replace the last hash. And this was my image, right? So this particular image which I have tokenized is now part of the um, metadata uh, here, which is pointing to a specific image. And it is also part of category art. I can of course add more um, uh, fields into this particular NFT, but I won't be able to add anything once that NFT is minted. If I have, if I wanted to, I should have done it before it was created. Now this NFT has been minted; it cannot be changed. And since it is just, uh, and and the beauty of this thing is, it is now living on HT, uh, instead of HTTP, it is living in IPFS. So nobody can modify this original artwork, right? So this original artwork will always be present in IPFS and its representation as ID number 62 will always be there um, on in the blockchain. Now this cannot be uh, this cannot be deleted. It will it, it since uh, this particular contract also has this delete function, um, which basically means burn this contract, uh, this particular token out of existence. Uh, unless I call that, nobody else can basically um, um, remove this particular thing from existence, right? So if uh, co contrary to this, if this token or this particular asset would be living on, say, uh, S3, the the holder or, or the owner of that particular account could have automatically deleted this uh, particular um, uh, file from uh, uh, the centralized storage provider. So whenever somebody would have gone to, say, here check checking uh, hey, uh, tell me what particular token ID 62 represents and who is owning all that. The moment you would have asked uh, it to uh, share the detail for token ID 62, you would see a URL, but then it wouldn't resolve anything, right? And that basically is like 
um, very much frowned upon. So that's why a lot of NFTs are now going to uh, are storing information in, in a decentralized storage as opposed to a, um, a traditional centralized storage. So this is all about um, um, uh, and creating how you create an NFT. You can of course go to OpenSea and and fill. So pretty much there are very various different marketplaces which also allows you to create, uh, provided that you have have a particular uh, wallet. And of course, you have to have a wallet, and you have to you have to check how much balance you have, and then after that, you can explore various other NFTs in the same platform as you've created it. Some marketplaces support multiple chains. That means you can create it uh, on Solana or on or on Ethereum or on any layer two. But more or less, you have to have a particular blockchain network to create an NFT um, over there, right? So coming back to it, um, I think, and of course, uh, you if you are like uh, a developer, then of course you can go ahead and create your own code, add some uh, additional things into it, and then deploy it directly into the network, and then uh, do everything programmatically as opposed to going through uh, doing it through a particular marketplace where there is also a cut. So you, whenever you have you are creating a token here, um, you may not or may you may not have to pay anything, but when you are trying to sell it, then you would have to pay a certain market or a platform fees, which may result from 1% to 2.5% even even more uh, in that in that particular aspect. So uh, there are pros and cons to each approach. But yeah, let's coming back to it. Um, I hope that you were able to at least get some some sense into how to create an NFT. It's a very simple process. I think uh, with with certain with these kind of tools uh, which are available, I think it's it's very easy to create one. Um, so if you are looking just to explore creation of NFTs, you can look, go to demo.mediateflow.com. Um, something this is we are creating. It is again an open source project. Uh, we can talk about it at a later point of time. But yeah, uh, once you have uh, created an NFT, you would be able to see that now it has certain attributes, right? So what you can essentially do after your NFT is created. Um, so many different projects. Uh, if I'm going to be mentioning only the topmost projects um, in, 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 that you must have heard of, then you must have heard of Board API Club, right? Which was basically a, a collection of NFT picture projects where you, these uh, uh, assets are representing a particular picture. Where uh, th these are like kind of a part of culture, you know, that they describe about a certain virtual avatar you know so these are like avatars that people buy people buy and then suddenly they the they demand grew in, in 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 very large numbers right then you have got decentralized decentraland which is something like a metaverse or a vr world and you can buy certain assets like land over there you can create some virtual assets like uh, like players and, and certain certain different assets in 3D and that people can buy and sell. So it is like one of the very, uh, uh, very good uh, projects out there you could try. I think if you if you've seen NBA top shots, so this basically is like the top highlight uh, of an NBA a, mo uh, a moment and that particular short video, that particular highlight is now represented as token. You can think of that as a collectible as well. And they did that NFT drop. Uh, I don't have to talk much about CryptoKitties. I think this was one of the first game that kind of like slowed the Ethereum uh, blockchain itself. Like this was so popular that everybody was trying to make their own kitty, uh, a, 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 like kittens, and then it could like breed and then it could grow over time, you know? So this was one of the game or maybe think of like a collect collectible and no one kitten would be like looking like the other, right? Uh, then there was CryptoPunks, which was like, again, uh, eight bit um, uh, pixelated, uh, images, which basically is like again a, a, a set of collection uh, of all of these uh, avatars that represent that are like part of again a particular culture, right? And some, something similar to Board API Club here. Um, then you have got Axie Infinity, that is again a game, uh, and 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 where you basically uh, buy some in-game assets to kind of like play uh, as a, a particular avatar or a particular uh, player and then you earn further more rewards you know and then there was the sandbox where you have again uh, some sort of nft gaming experience so you buy some nft avatars you buy some uh, in-game nft assets and then you play a particular uh, uh, you, you you do some quests and then from there you get some other additional rewards which are again in in particular 
uh, of some sort certain value that you can sell. So these are like again going into play to earn use cases. So you just play a particular game and then you uh, you gain more and more virtual assets and then you can sell that to make real money. You know. So and there are various various more other NFT based projects uh, coming in in similar lines or something different, doing something different as well. Right. So with uh, with that particular movement and 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 becoming uh, in so much demand, I think the demand of uh, of this particular NFT and, and it has been growing in a, a very 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 at a very huge rate. So it has been predicted that the increasing use of NFT and just thinking of this in supply chain and logistics basically creates demand across the decentralized market fact uh, marketplaces and it is supposed to reach about 357 billion USD by 2030. So we have only seen and NFTs are currently in very nascent stage. So uh, you could right now you were only thinking like oh, okay so all I'm just all all of these just a, a, a token an NFT is just a JPEG right. So that is like very very rudimentary or very very uh, low level representation of what an NFT could be. Right now they are but sooner or later they can represent a lot of different things right and that is where the future is uh, is headed. So let's come down to NFT use cases. Now you have created a particular token. Um, how is is this going to become the next thing which is very which makes things like digital rights management DRM very easy to track and very easy to to a certain right? So currently if I'm going to be talking about use cases, then the first most use case is creators economy, right? So if you are an artist and you want to uh, showcase your art or your creativity to the world. There are various. There, are, there would be very small number of platforms that you would basically interact with. But with NFT, you could tokenize your art and 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 basically become an overnight uh, viral phenomenon. Uh, that we have seen with a lot of different uh, artists and and creators like I think people and all. They their artwork was sold for millions and millions of dollars. So these are like one on one artwork where you have to create one artwork and then share it with the community and then basically everything grows organically as well from there. So that uh, and, uh, and when I say artwork, it doesn't mean like JPEG, but it could be your music. It could be your video. You could have like some sort of poem or anything that you think uh, is, is part of your creativity. Definitely it creates its own ecosystem. I think you can also see this from creators or influencer network like there are like a lot of influencers now coming to NFTs a bandwagon where they are bringing their own community support. Support and help uh, into creating uh, a newer economy for their own. Um, um, branding and, and 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 valuations right so the second one would be game I think uh, I think we all would have played a game of some, of some sorts right and a lot of passionate gamers buy these in-game assets let's say you buy a skin of a weapon you buy a specific asset in game itself now what happens is like the moment uh, the game um, you you try to create a different account or if the, you have bought that particular asset you cannot sell it you have to have that in, in, in the same ecosystem uh, within that particular platform. You have to sell it back to another person. And also uh, there are also some bottlenecks with the gaming industry itself, uh, uh, especially virtual virtual gaming considered with NFTs. What you could do is like uh, the moment you are not using that particular in game asset, you could rent it out to someone else. Somebody else can use that skin, NFT skin and then they can buy that and then uh, for a certain period of time and then they can return it back to you. Also, you can resell it to someone else if you're not going to play that game after some while. So it basically opens up a various different um, uh, aspect. Also, you could stream your game to a larger community and each an NFT holder could also like view your stream and also there are like multiple use cases. Also variable NFTs. Now this is something going into the section of like connecting tangible asset as a digital item. So rather than ha your uh, uh, physical item just represent a UUID in a database, you could mint it as an NFT. And now not only you have got this physical asset, but also it is representing a digital token as well. So what it essentially means that you can also have a particular entire supply chain and track inventory tracking at, at the point this particular physical item was conceived or uh, the raw materials were sourced and then uh, what kind of supply chain it followed whether this particular item is authentic or not all of these tracking is very easy with that nft altogether you know so these are the three core assets but also there are more like 
now it is coming into the asset tokenization zone you can virtually think of any other asset now you can think of debt uh, you could you could token is a particular debt you can tokenize an invoice you can tokenize um, a particular uh, uh, financial obligation so in fintech also there are certain use cases right um now if you think of virtual assets now there are certain domain names uh, uh, some some uh, passes uh, that you could de definitely uh, get as an nft token gated community you want to have your own community but only certain holders could have access to so uh, to this particular community think of this as a club now you are creating a particular club and only certain people who are NFT can access that i think through wearable nfts we have seen uh, how this particular use cases are going to be very big uh, and entire uh, logistics and supply chain uh, ecosystem is going to be disrupted with this particular thing gaming i think i have explained one particular use case there are a lot of different use cases that allow you to do a lot of different things with gaming i think there are certain projects that i'm seeing are also creating uh, a bridge between decentralized finance and uh, gaming like some sort of like a, a you you earn and and then you make money and then you also create additional value for the viewers and and gamers and creators as well so everyone is happy and of course the art and collectible are like very common nft use cases right so if if we want to get more understanding of how this also connect to metaverse so think of this uh, not just having an creation creating a particular nft think of this as uh, like launching in a specific experience right now if you are thinking uh, what kind of different nfts you could pretty much like uh, like launch right so first of the first and foremost i think you would have definitely looked into pfp profile picture projects or avatars right you can launch a particular collection that represent a particular picture or that particular represent a specific uh, artwork right uh, in that particular thing now uh, that particular uh, avatar would be again you have to buy that and then that is becoming becoming like a digital identity now it is something you uh, some of them are also represent some of them are also saying that certain collections are becoming digital rolex right they are becoming your digital avatar um another type of experience is like one on one artwork like you can tokenize your photography you are doing nighttime photography if you are a very good musician you you create good videos you can tokenize that as well so that is another um, um nft experience that you can launch the third aspect which is generative art uh, that is something the machine basically draws or creates that artwork by itself right so and that automatically gets tokenized tokenized and of course this means like uh, the art would actually be photographically that it has it has been it, it it was very much unique in nature and it was there was no human involvement at all required i think there are certain use cases you can look into for generative art as well utilities which is going to be a very big market within the nft ecosystem uh, when i talk about utility nft is like so these uh, if i'm going to talk about pfp artwork and all so these means like there is just one particular uh, asset that is having a certain value and that is what the nft is representing but what if not only it is representing a particular image but if it is representing a particular utility so think of this holding a holding this particular nft gives you the rights and privileges um to go to do a to particular club or access a, a specific subscription or access or go to certain events uh, uh by by certain celebrity so think of these things so you hold an nft every month there is certain event that you get exclusive access to right also you can get some sort of like a merch drop you know merchandise drops that can happen you could meet a specific person uh, also you could uh, just to rent out a uh, specific thing i th i think an utility nft are like a specific section if i'm going to talk about it then it will take a long time but think of this as like uh, you own that nft and then you are getting something in return every week or every month just by holding that nft it may be also royalties of some sorts as well right so that is what another aspect of utility nft that is still being explored and soon everything you would be seeing that it's part of utility as well then you have another nft experiences like tables think of like baseball cards think of think of uh, something which is uh, 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 which people would cherish down the line like in future is still there will be like some values associated with it and that's why and be a top shop i think um, icc the uh, the um, international cricket board also 
uh, or I think some BCCI, they were also thinking like creating com collectibles around cricketers as well, right? And so, and certain other, every other sports are going to create their own uh, cards and collectibles and something around that as well. Um, I think I think there is also some uh, other company like Marvel or DC. Uh, they launched their own NFT collections. I think there were some car companies who are launching their own connect collectibles as well. The second thing, the the, the third thing is in, after that is gamified NFTs. I think in-game assets, the game you play as an avatar, that could be something. So think of this, you start a game and then you mint an NFT, which is your digital avatar. And then as you, you proceed with the game, you collect some kind of experience points, you collect some kind of like uh, access and experience, right? All of these things. Also uh, think of this uh, as, a, as, a, as a gamified NFT experience. So that what, what it could be like, you have a particular uh, way of doing things. And since NFT is public in nature, every other game or every other platform can now listen to it and then can, uh, can design the experience around that particular, particular product. So if I'm going to give you an example, Think of that, but think of an NFT which is about uh, tracking your uh, particular genre of music you listen to, what kind of uh, albums you like, and what kind of uh, musicians you prefer uh, um, uh, listening to. Right now, you could access any music streaming platform, and they could li uh, check your music. Uh, history from there and then they could give you a, a different experience rather than going to all of these applications and setting up your exp uh, setting up your own experiences in 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 all of these platform individually which is very much time consuming right so that would be something uh, across gaming also you could do that across whenever you are playing two different first person shooter games this something could be interchangeable and composable right so you could you could inter this this nft could be interoperable across different platforms the second last thing that I want to talk about is soul bound tokens. Now, this is a very interesting concept. Um, uh, soul bound tokens are, uh, uh, are basically digital tokens or tokens, which is like tied to your soul. So as the name represent. Um, so you simple use cases include uh, your uh, degree certificates, your educational qualifications, your particular um, uh, uh, accomplishments or achievements. Now these NFTs, when they, when they when they get to your wallet, you cannot transfer them. You cannot sell them because these are tied to your digital identity. And now you cannot transfer them. So think of this employment verification. Let's say if you have all your degree certificate as part of a soul bound NFT, it would be very quick to ascertain whether you have particular skill set, whether you are qualified for this, whether you really worked with Microsoft or not, uh, or some other particular company that you say that you had worked in the past. So all of these things is going to be very, very easier with just having sold on NFT. And as all of this information is like public in nature, they could automatically verify whether you are a graduate from this university, worked in this particular company, did some kind of course here or not. So all of this would be setting your digital identity in a chronological fashion, which is very much easier for other companies um, to kind of like reevaluate. Also, I've, I've, I've heard certain buzz around uh, enterprise NFTs. So it could, these NFTs could be given to employees within a particular company, which again would be issued by the employer, but again uh, would be discoverable across the, uh, other uh, other organizations as well. Then the thing is like, then another is like ARX. Uh, uh, this is something augmented interactive reality experiences. So this would be an NFT which you can interact with. So rather than creating in-game assets as NFT. Think of this entire game is an NFT altogether. Uh, and what happens basically is like you play, you you access the NFT, you you behave, you interact with an NFT, and then if you are completing a particular stage or a, or a level or you have reached the end of the game, whatever it is, or you are interacting with NFT in certain way, then certain Easter egg gets uh, gets exposed, and then you get that. So something like gamified NFT experiences, and also you could have this. Accessed in a metaverse, in the AR VR experience. So that sort of experience is also something um, certain companies or, or 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 creators are looking into. And this is again like very much small subset that I was able to explain to. I think there are a lot more in 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 uh, in dev current development, and and a lot of companies are exploring this field. So definitely expect this list to grow tenfold in coming times. Um. 
so if you are a particular company now again this uh, I, i've not structured it only for developers or for newcomers but also if you are a particular cxos or if you want to make some decision making uh, for launching an nft experience for your own company uh, if you are thinking of that particular process then this is how it nft experience looks like right um, now this the very very low hanging fruit would be like you create an nft store you uh, have your web2 assets you could you want to have a, another avenue for your web3 get, getting into the world of web3 you could create a marketplace where everybody could buy a certain assets uh, as nft from your marketplace right so you could you you could be a, a creator and seller yourself or you could onboard further more sellers and then you could launch as a platform where every seller basically uh, create certain artwork and then they get royalties and every seller uh, basically also are are getting uh, money for selling their artwork and every time it gets sold from one buyer to another buyer uh, one buyer to another buyer then they will be basically making some sort of royalty payments as part of that 10% or 5% whatever they have set that particular value as well then there is like augmented interactive nfts which is again like part of interactive nfts and then the third thing is like utilities uh, where you have an nft which you can rent you can also lend there is like a fractional ownership now you have got an nft you can fractionalize it into these different chunks of fungible tokens and what you can do with it is like you will be able to um uh, like make a fractional ownership like I, th I think i've seen some use cases where there was a land or the particular house that they have fractionalized it and now many people are able to uh, 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 sell and and do certain things around it and they are all getting royalties uh, as part of that particular uh, real estate fractional real estate i think that concept is has been for ages but with nft it is like making it more transparent again having an nft would give you access to certain things like access to certain events access to certain uh, utilities now that is also another part of utility nft and there are further more uh, as well fourth experience you could launch as it would be like when you you're, you're launching a new shoes or you're launching a new wallet or something you could also tie something uh, uh, significantly into it which allows that nft uh, which allows that particular uh, asset or merchandise to live as part of nft as well so that would be something wearable nft uh, you could also explore fifth would be subscription nft now you are already a service provider you've got your digital uh, service or maybe it's a it's a, a brick and mortar shop and you have got a specific service that you offer to or cater to your customers you could look into getting into web3 world and offer as a, as a side um, uh, as a ad, ad additional revenue avenue uh, you could think of like giving an nft which every user has to hold on to and pay regularly to have access to that particular uh, uh, service you know so that is something uh, people have been, uh, companies are exploring right now subscriptions as and things think saas uh, software as a service but as nfts so you don't have just a database number which is at the whim of a particular company uh, but as a part of decentralized uh, as a part of decent uh, on uh, on top of decentralized network where things are uh, having one particular uh, rule and it won't be changed after once they have minted so that is the kind of value the transparency immutability that you get which is going to enhance the saas model to subscription nft model now once you have defined on the experience then you have to choose the authentication whether you want to cater to web3 web3 community who is already understanding all of these terms they already know how to configure their wallet and not or you want to launch uh, uh, um, uh, to a, a set of users who are very much new to the web world, where you have to set up a custodial wallet for themselves, where you, they have to work with a particular uh, company to uh, have access or custody of their funds. Now, and then you choose a payment mechanism, whether you want to accept crypto payment, you want to accept fiat-based payment, and you have to choose which blockchain you want to get onto. Of course, here you would be working with cryptocurrency exchanges, on-ramp offering services, and there you go. That, that's how you typically launch an NFT experience. And yeah, this was all in 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 uh, entire explanation. Uh, I think uh, I've covered almost things that are uh, uh, communicated in a way that you are getting into your into the uh, world of NFTs. I'm open to any questions. Um, and yeah, looking forward to uh, seeing all of you getting into the world of NFTs or or starting creating as as a collect creator or as a collector. Uh, hello. Yeah, just hold on. Thank you so much, uh, Sachindra. Wonderful uh, introduction to NFTs. Uh, Thanks, Arvind.
So now we'll open for questions. I think Raja, you were asking something. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, would you know tomorrow the software licensing model will start adopting NFTs? Good question. I, I have just like a week back saw about this. Like you have you now you have got like code base which is sitting on GitHub. Now you want to use it. You have to buy a, or a hold of a particular NFT to use that particular code. So I think this software licenses as a token is not new. I think back in 2017 or 18, I worked around a particular model which allowed uh, open source projects to kind of uh, cater to um, other creators or, or coders. But with NFTs, I think this definitely is up for dis disruptions because I think that would be a very good use case. And of course, you could automatically track the IP and transfer it to other people holding that particular uh, copyright to that code base as well. So that is a very good use case. And what will happen to real estate? You know, would it be, I mean, I think government registrations, will they become obsolete? Uh... Um, not instantly. I mean, I believe that uh, even though, I mean, people think like, uh, once you have the NFT, now you are the sole owner of it. It's not exactly that. I think the current stage of NFT is like you have the rights to the token. The moment you create the token, you minimum you buy the token, the actual token you have rights to, and that gives you the rights to use the original asset as if you would be able to resale or resell that particular asset. But the owner or the particular person who has created that digital artwork doesn't usually... Um, uh, transfers the the rights of that particular token when you buy that uh, 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 token representing that artwork. So same in the same terms of real estate, I think the government laws and, and rules will still be intact unless you have uh, a certain way to ascertain whether this land is actually representing this particular token. So I think there will be some sort of government regulation definitely involving in the in the present times till the time where everything becomes digitized i i think there has to be some sort of like a a, a gateway or a connector uh, connecting these two two worlds together sure yeah the final question and i've seen a lot of certificate management platforms coming up mm -hmm. over blockchain right they give you your 2d uh, you know uh, scanning uh, qr code right but how does it actually be tamper proof because everybody is using a different network so that way, you know, tomorrow I can always create another certificate with my network and then that will actually be a fake certificate. I still approve it. Again, uh, the thing is like when you are getting a certificate, it's not like you're creating it on your own, right? Your the particular issuer has to issue your certificate, right? Right. Let's say you are working for a company called XYZ. Now XYZ company will have its own wallet address and they will have to issue a certificate to you once they have issued the certificate to you if i'm if i'm talking in terms of soul bound nft as an and that certificate as nft now you cannot destroy that you cannot transfer it anybody to anybody else and everybody would be able to view that yes you have been issued this particular certificate so that is something uh, of a use case here and if somebody who is creating digital certificate like uh, a certificate of of graduation or something but the the issuer is not identified nobody knows this issuer and also you may have created it on your own then that would don't have any value you know i mean no but uh, see in the, digital, can... in the digital certificate you at least have one entity on the top correct uh, but here you know like you know yeah see somebody talks about you know uh, i don't know about big blockchain but i see a lot of networks coming up one is a network, sub-network, you know. Are they all connected to one root fellow who will sign ultimately? Um, so when you say of network, you mean like blockchain network, right? Ethereum, Solana. Yeah, Cosmos, right, right. Or, yes, yes. Right. So you, yeah, you are, it is a very good question because the because one issuer may use Ethereum to issue NFTs and another, uh, let's say your college issues an NFT on Ethereum network and your employer issues an NFT on Polygon and then you have you have you are taking a course somewhere that issued on Solana network. Of course, you will have three different wallet addresses or maybe maybe different wallet addresses. So there is something called DID, decentralized identifiers. These are blockchain agnostics. And you could definitely connect all of these 
blockchain network together as part of your digital identity i'm talking again i'm i'm moving away from here to going into the world of self sovereign identities where your identity is managed by yours you yourself and a lot of enterprises are looking into that as well so i think uh, with the uh, in, uh, integration of ssis and nfts i think this whatever you are saying is definitely uh, achievable and i i don't see that future being very far off so that means you know overall you know this digital certificate using you know the thumb drives you know would become absolute and eventually absolutely yeah because and that can only happen or or i, I don't want to like overstep here but i think it is becoming it will become a lot easier with the concept of self sovereign identities that means you maintain your own identity rather than your identity managed by someone else if if you know what i mean okay bye right. thank you so much so sure. thank you raja for those interesting questions anyone else please so uh, one uh, simple question uh, you mentioned you know i can also put my digital asset let's say in aws centralized correct. storage correct and uh, of course the problem is that uh, i created the token uh, but two months later i deleted that uh, file yes. on aws yes so that is one problem the second problem is uh, let's say the file is still there same file name same uri but i modified the content because nothing prevents me from modifying the content so will the uh, crypto token catch this that the original art uh, image has been modified good very good questions yes so the for, to answer to your first question i think this has happened i think um, uh, several times uh, this this concept is called rug pulled so what happens is like you, when you are buying the token uh, that token is basically show, showing you that this is this is a very good picture of this particular uh, um, uh, scenery or this particular image or animal or whatever and after you have bought it that creator because he has having access to aws himself he can just delete that and now your token doesn't represent anything so whatever uh, nft you bought uh, say like uh, like like 1500 rupees or 1500 dollar for example now is becoming zero and that is the that that particular uh, phenomenon is called rug pulls so that's why I, i explained you right that particular code where you can go to the contract read the code and see whether this particular thing is ipfs or aws the moment you see here https slash s3 dot something or google dot drives them something then you can be sure that sometime google can go offline or some creator who is having access to that account can always delete it so you are at the mercy of that particular creator to not change this um and uh, so you will always have that particular val uh, token representing the same asset so you have to verify yourself so that's the thing with blockchain you you trust but also verify you just don't take things at their face value so and every con every Uh, nft collection is like having a uh, and also you want to read the contract it's very easy so every uh, everything on blockchain has its own wallet address so you go to the contract see here the green check uh, it should be true for every blockchain uh, or, or, or if you go to the block explorer you can see the code here and that code uh, you you can read the code here that what it means and if there is any audits there you see i think some of the good projects you will see uh, they will have some sort of like audits as well Uh, there will be like a page um uh, you can submit an audit report so here it will say that this has been audited as well so all of these things you have to verify before you get into this buying an nft i mean the concept is lucrative but chances if you if you're not understanding this or if you're not following through some experiment some some existing tutorial then you may be rug, you may be getting experience to a rug pull uh, to answer your second question just like uh, deleting it of course you can uh, uh, so same person oh, if he has having access to that centralized storage then he can also uh, remove certain uh, content and replace that content with something else as well and unfortunately no unless that asset is on chain living on the blockchain itself there is no way for this particular blockchain to 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 check whether the content was modified or not because when you read the contract when you read that particular value right it will always give you that particular uh, for that token id it will always it will always give you that particular url now whatever will be that on that url that information does 
doesn't get altered on chain. So. Uh, yeah, so you have to be very sure uh, what kind of NFT you're buying and or you're creating. So these issues are not there if you store it in IPFS, I suppose. Yes, so if you're storing it in IPFS, there is no way that uh, the the this particular thing, which was I think. Uh, which which is like IPFS or IO will be ever changed because once it goes to IPFS network, this becomes like immutable. You cannot this hash. Uh, you, you know how storage happens, right? We, we are usually uh, when we learn computing or when you, you have when you learn Unix, basically everything is a file and then there will be like a specific location. Now you access files by their file name and where it is stored, right? So it will be under C drive, under a particular folder, under a subfolder, and then you have got like a.jpng or jpg. IPFS doesn't work that way. IPFS works uh, by breaking down the file into chunks and then each every each and every chunk will be a hash and then you combine all of these chunks to get that uh, main file itself. So the file itself can be stored anywhere. You re get you you you, re you recreate the file when you are getting it uh, by its hash and this hash will never change. If you're familiar with SHA-256 hashing algorithm uh, that uh, it's a one way function, so same kind of function distributed hash table gets uh, used here and this cannot be changed by anybody else. And uh, if I'm talking about its downtime, since it is a decentralized network, even if one of the node is running, you will be able to access your artwork. You will be able to access your file. So um, this is not like a central point of failure that gets associated here in IPFS. Thank you for that. Uh, one question. Uh, I'm asking sure. this not from a developer perspective, but rather as a user. OK, so let's say I go on a. On a tour, let's say I go to Ladakh or something. I take a bunch of pictures. Mm -hmm. I come back previously, maybe in the old days I used to put it on Flickr. Let's say sharing my yes. photos with the world. Now in the new world, I am not going to put it on Flickr. Rather, I am yeah. going to upload it to a blockchain and create an NFT out of it. Photos of Ladakh. Got it. Yes, right? you can. So you think that this is a valid use case? They, uh, I mean, uh, such things will happen in the future. It's already happening as we speak. Uh, tokenizing photography. Uh, Zora, I think it was Zora or Co. Sorry about it. Uh, and also OpenSea as well. Like uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, creators creating uh, their token, uh, they're, they're tokenizing their existing artwork um, as an NFT. So you can somebody has created this thing. Somebody would have definitely just somebody has just created this particular color and buying. Then now they're selling it for 0.066 ETH, which is like about what hundred dollar or something. So people have been already doing this and there is significant market for this. So this is a picture, right? So definitely somebody would have created this picture or would have taken it from a, from a mobile phone and now they are selling it for like about what? A million dollars. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's, it's already happening as we speak. So um, this is and of course there is this whole new concept of music NFTs. There are people have been creating JP, JPG, JPEGs, uh, GIFs um, and, and so on, you know, and, and of course brush strokes and all uh, those NFTs are there. So just let me just show something else real quick here. Uh, try to share you the real uh, wallet that I have. Let me know if you're able to see my brave. Brave browser. So this is so say this is my personal account, right? Um, yeah. I go here. So this is this is the collection. So let's see if I have what how how what kind of collections, what kind of NFTs do I have? Right, so let me just. These are created by you. No, 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 not, not me. These are like I, this is like explore collection. I'm just logging into my wallet. So I have a, I have a crypto wallet here, which is like a brave wallet. So I have another wallet. Now it shows let me like what is my um, what is my total balance? What what kind of funds I have now? If I go to my own uh, profile and I'm just showing you OpenSea here, right? So this is again uh, for different network. I'll have different assets. So in in my wallet, I have got these many NFTs. So just to give you an example, I have got like a domain name as NFT itself. So I bought some domain names, uh, Sachindra.eat, NitCPO.eat, some of the product I've created for myself. That is another NFT domain. Now this is an NFT created by someone else, right? 
as i said there will be like a, any asset will have a lifetime life a lifetime around a particular nft right so this particular nft has its metadata it has its name it has its description it has a traits like uh, the edition is 27 out of 100 this is a particular um, a website uh, now there are certain details this is a contract address this is the token uh, number so token id is 463 in a particular collection uh, my token id is 463 now it was created or minted by someone named nelly uh, two years ago and then she listed this for 0.27 eth um, i don't know about 200 dollar whatever it is whatever price it was now that got transferred to me two years ago uh, on october 9th now i have this right so this is like owned by me right now if i want to sell it all i need to do is here go is go and put here a sell and this particular token i i can put for like let's say i want to put like for one eth now one eth is like i'm selling this particular nft for like 1200 dollars right i can put like whatever number i want like i i, I can sell it for 50 eth which is like 60000 dollars now the duration it will be shown on the home page for a one month i can put some more uh, options here now the fees associated like open will take 2.5% the creator is going to get 10% so if i sell it for 50 ETH, it is like out of 60 out of like let's say for one just for one so out of thousand dollars i will be uh, it will be deducting 10% and then 2.5% i will be receiving somewhere around what um i guess 850 dollars or something around that number right so that is what it is and it and once the moment i i do complete listing it is going to be visible on the all nfts uh, page uh, so this is like an experience for a collector. Now I am a collector. I I didn't create this. Somebody else was created created it, and I just uh, got it. And now I can sell it for a certain price. Now think of this uh, this NFT. Now I want to buy this NFT. Then I have to pay this much uh, price. And now that I will be able to collect this one as well. So this could be very well created by you as well. And this is for like eight dollars and there will be some sort of stats and all you can make an offer you can see the life cycle like uh, it got minted then and then it was trading for certain values and now i i don't want to be a collector anymore all i i want to now create my own token now i want to create my nft then all i need to do is go to create page and um, i think I, I showed the creation part right so automatically you create a new item uh, by uploading your picture, image, audio, 3D model, giving a name, detail, price, and just you put supply and then you choose which network you want to deploy it on. And then, yeah, that's that's how it is. So here you could put your picture of Ladakh or anywhere, or it can be even a, a, a digital artwork as well. So uh, am I then, uh, or are the creators stuck to this platform OpenSea? Suppose they uh, put it here. Uh -huh. So there are many, many platforms. Uh, there is something called foundation.app. Uh, there is something called super rare. There are like hundreds my question of is, sorry, My question is about the interop. Yeah. Uh, I created the artwork or let's say the token I created on OpenSea. Right. Can I trade it? Uh, can somebody buy it from another? Yes, platform? yes, yes, you can. So let's say you have a, a platform called uh, Rarible. So Rarible is like uh, for rare NFT like uh, it's it's by name itself it's very rare you know so it it is like something like a curated platform now this nft you can create it here and i think rareable nfts are also available as like a collection on OpenSea as well because it is it is interoperable uh, you have to have a collection from this rareable. so you see here it's upon this market now again I am not saying that it it will be because it is uh, the marketplace is like OpenSea and OpenSea founders or or the company may decide whether to list another uh, token from uh, another ex another collection or not. Right? It, yeah. I, I hope you're getting it. But yeah, yeah. from a technological perspective, uh, everything is basically a, a blockchain number, right? And a, a, a contract in a blockchain, and that is public in nature. So there is nobody stopping. To get that value from there and then create. But are they on different list. blockchains? Like OpenSea is a different blockchain, Rarible is a different blockchain. No, 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 no. So the blockchain is not the OpenSea. So OpenSea is the marketplace which is supporting okay. two blockchains, so, say Ethereum main network and Polygon network, for example, right? Okay, okay. So Rarible would be supporting again that network. So then only you will be able to see these two, these NFTs connected together. So if some if you are looking into some other marketplace which supports solana then 
uh, the NFT won't be visible onto other platform. Why? Because these two block NFTs are on two separate networks, and oh, okay, okay, and it cannot be. For that, you have to do bridging. So what will happen is like your NFT will be locked in one network, and then that same NFT will somehow ex start existing on another network. It's like a cross uh, bridge, like cross platform, cross network uh, transfer of NFTs. So that is some other concept which because this, that involves bridges. So you have a bridge from Ethereum to Solana, you have a bridge from Ethereum to Polygon and Ethereum to Binance Smart Chain. That would involve like transferring your NFT from one network, uh, locking an, it in another one network and then using it on another network and then uh, doing your business activities and then you can always transfer it back to another network as well. So it is like multi-chain concept uh, is there and that is again currently in exploration. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from others? No questions. Uh, so thank you, Sachindra, uh, and thank you also for one question, things. please. Uh, Raja, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So now, uh, what is like? Let's say that you know, I yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Raja, some disturbance from your end. Yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So what uh, uh yeah, what happens, you know, if a company gets let's say a lot of profit. Okay. And then they create these assets and then show the losses. <laughs> uh it is so easy, right? Yeah, because it is in a self-control. Yeah, please don't read that it is in my mind. But I was saying, you know, how legal or how illegal is it, you know, uh, to trade on these platforms? Mm -mm. Very good question. I think this again, like, it is not a technical question. So again, let me just indulge you for a bit. Like, I mean, the whole concept of crypto or like decentralization, decentralized finance is again going towards both ends uh, you can of course have financial freedom uh, doing finance at, at at your own time and pace and without any regulation and without any restrictions but again you could when you sh when you're saying like show these losses or show these gains it is again very much of a of a relative term right to whom are you talking about to whom are you going to show this as a as a loss because blockchain doesn't really care or the entire marketplace doesn't really care whether you are you are making billions or millions, or whether you are losing a uh, hundred million dollar to like zero to go getting to a hundred dollar uh, from from that high number to a small number. But again, if you're thinking this from a tax perspective and all, then I think the regulation around NFTs is not very clear. And uh, technically, uh, I, I'm not sure how would you perceive this as like uh, as a benefit to. to 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 not show losses or gains uh, if you're talking in tax terms. So I think this is something in coming times be will become much more clear with when you have got industry accepting it uh, and using it and several com companies and enterprises using it. And then of course, there will be some government regulation around how you want to buy because eventually it is a crypto token, right? You have to to buy an NFT. You have to have some some crypto with your wallet itself. So I think from there they would the tracking could come in. To understand whether this is something legal or something illegally you have been doing. Sure. So finally, what it means, you know, though it is decentralized, not owned by government, mm -hmm. once the regulation start coming in, you know, all those benefits, I mean, they can actually uh, put in their legal uh, power in the network, right? Again, like it is again very much a complex topic because uh, you have got like different types of law coming in, right? Uh, blockchain again doesn't care about GDPR. I, I think GDPR was a big buzz, right? Uh, but now you have got this user data on blockchain. How can you ask the company who is using blockchain as a storage layer to delete some information because blockchain doesn't allow you to do that, right? Blockchain by, by its own definition gives you uncontrolled, unrestricted access to certain things that you can do, right? So even if you have got government regulation coming in, uh, how are you going to make all of these things is going to be a tough task. 
So of course, there will be some sort of like a, a, a compromise between what you get to do when you are on this particular platform in that particular jurisdiction where the company is being set up because these marketplaces will have to be run by traditional corporations, right? If you are if you are thinking this from an enterprise perspective, then of course there will be some sort of regulation because that company will have certain jurisdiction. Uh, and if you are directly interacting with a smart contract deployed by any particular person who you don't know and uh, and you're interacting with, then I don't think there is going to be any more uh, uh, pur purview of any regulation in that particular sense. So it, there are always two sides to the same coin. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So Sachindra, let's say I'm a developer and I'm a beginner. From mm -hmm. your talk, I gathered that the whole landscape is very complex. You have so many different networks, then different platforms, wallets, and then you mentioned about auditing, what to look for when you are looking at a contract. So right. all this is uh, like it's not easy to learn. We got a sense of it from this talk. Mm -hmm. So what would be your advice to beginners who are developers or non-developers? How do they get started engaging in right. NFTs? Again, I would again everybody. Uh, if you are thinking this is a little bit complex, I I assure you that it is not. I the whole thing. You you could if uh, if you're doing this as a hackathon, then you could do it within like 48 hours. So I, I have done it myself many times, like getting a new new concept and understanding it. So the way you can start with is like building up, uh, understanding your data structure, learning a particular programming language, uh, preferably JavaScript or GoLang, and then starting a particular bootcamp. Like very early, you can get into the com concept of blockchain. What blockchain essentially it how it achieves that particular characteristics and then starting with your first basic smart contract so starting with the first basic smart contract shouldn't take less anything more than of 10 to 16 hours and that you can come very comfortably do uh, if you have got a good uh, two to three year of a programming experience right and after that you've you've covered the basics of like how you create a contract because everything in in the solidity uh, or in the nft terms is pretty much becomes become has become a standard so to just work with a nft contract you just have to import a library by open zeppelin which is one of the most trusted ones and then you can just start creating your NFT collections and, and get into this entire world, uh, into the world of NFT. So it won't be that much of a difficult. All you need to do is start with uh, just simple interaction with blockchain, the uh, understanding blockchain, just sending Ethereum from one wallet to another. That would be your step one. And another step would be like writing simple smart contract, right? Storing a number and verify and showcasing the number, building calculator kind of smart contract, and then the next step would be to create a token contract and the fourth step would be like getting into nfts and all so that would be how you would get into a developer journey and there are various tutorials um online uh, that you could go ahead with and and get from basic to uh, intermediate or even an advanced level uh, blockchain developer thank you so much for spending your saturday morning and preparing uh, so many you wonderful slides for this talk uh, so on behalf of the others in the audience, uh, thanks again. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. It was completely my pleasure, and I'm I'm looking. And of course, uh, uh, shoot me uh, anytime any questions if you have any uh, uh, any query on getting into NFTs or anything. I definitely would be happy to help.